He kept saying, help. A 13-year-old boy is rushed to the ER with massive bleeding on his brain. They took him for the CT scan, and I said, it's something serious, isn't it? And he said, yeah, it is. Watch as this teen makes a miraculous recovery. We felt he was going to be OK. Plus, he was young and drunk. They said, you don't want to be responsible for this. There's two girls that are dead in that car over there. And got what he didn't deserve. Here was this mother who lost her daughter, looking at the guy who took that from her and saying that I forgive you. His story of redemption, all on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. When 13-year-old Isaiah Custodio left football practice because of health issues, his father initially thought he was just dehydrated. But the reality was much worse. Isaiah had somehow developed intracranial hemorrhaging. He needed emergency surgery, and even that was no guarantee that it would save his life. September 8, 2015. 13-year-old Isaiah Custodio was at football practice when he got a severe headache and began throwing up. After getting a call from the coach, Isaiah's mom, Christina, came to the field. And that's when I saw him kind of stumbling. I just thought, that's kind of strange. He was saying one word at a time. He kept saying home, hurt, and help. Then I realized something else was wrong. To be safe, Christina took him to the hospital. On the way, she called her husband, Ozzy, who met them there. And I just remember saying, Isaiah is just dehydrated. Maybe he just needs a lot of water, and he's going to be OK. While waiting to see the doctor, Isaiah struggled to communicate and keep his eyes open. Something told me to look in his eyes. I didn't really know what I was doing. So I got my cell phone out, and I shined a light into each eye, and I noticed his pupils were not responding. And that's when I started questioning, OK, something is not right here. They alerted one of the nurses, who immediately took Isaiah back for evaluation. They took him for the CT scan, and when he came back, I could just tell that something was not right. And I said, it's something serious, isn't it? And he said, yeah, it is. The scan revealed a cluster of blood vessels in Isaiah's brain had ruptured and that he needed immediate surgery. Pediatric neurosurgeon Dr. Christopher Troop was on duty. He had a lot of blood uh, in his brain. It was causing a lot of pressure and kind of matched how bad he looked on his exam. Dr. True prepared the family for the worst. There was a chance he could bleed to death on the table. At this point, we were just trying to save his life and that um, he could still have a very bad outcome from this, even if he survived. Now I am talking to God and saying, what in the world is going on? I said, why, why not me? Just take me in place of, of him. As the team started to wheel Isaiah into surgery, Christina stopped them. I said, do you pray? And um, Dr. Troop said, absolutely. And Dr. Troop prayed over him. And I think that moment when he said amen, we felt he was going to be OK. I, I started feeling peace during that time. It was, a, it was just incredible just to see people that we didn't know, uh, these doctors and nurses just gather around, everybody holding hands and just praying around my son. While they waited, Christina sent out a call for prayer. Many came to the hospital. When they don't just pray, when they show up to pray with you, it's just powerful. The surgical team successfully removed the clot and stopped the bleeding. But Dr. Troop cautioned that Isaiah may be unable to speak or even recognize his family when he woke up. It was the best feeling to see him open his eyes and um, acknowledge us. I mean, he's alive and he knew who we were and it was joy. When Dr. Troop came to the doorway, I immediately got up and gave him a big grand hug. I was starting to feel that God was was doing what, you know, he said all along that he would do, and that is take care of us. Recovery would be slow for Isaiah. The injury had affected his ability to speak, and he lost partial use of the right side of his body. 
making it a struggle to walk. The simplest way they explained it to me was it was like having a baby and then the baby having to take those baby steps again. Through therapy, hard work, and prayer, he continued to improve. As his speech recovery progressed, he was even able to do what he had missed most, playing his trumpet. It took a while, but I learned to play with my left hand. What keeps me going, my mom, my dad, my grandfather, my grandmother, they keep me on pace. Back in school, Isaiah was soon walking on his own and was even able to act and sing. He's come a long way and has big plans for the future. I want to be a physical therapist because I know what happened to me and I want to give back. His spirit has always been there, his drive. There was never quit in him. His personality just lights up the room. There's not one moment that goes by that I don't thank God. When somebody's asking me, you know, how's your son doing, that I don't mention God's name. He's a miracle, it's just God. People are still praying for him, and I know that God continues to work in him. I know that God saved me because he works with me every single day. You know, God's always with all of us every single day. It's interesting, isn't it, how we can just go along really not acknowledging or necessarily recognizing that in any way until something like this happens and it can come out of the blue just like it did for Isaiah. And it impacts everybody, him, his family, his extended family, even the medical team that worked for him, his classmates. God wants to reveal to us who he is. He wants to reveal his trustworthiness. And that's part of what we need to grab hold of when we're asking God for prayer to meet our needs in some big capacity. It might be a physical healing that we need. It might be financial. It might be relational. It might be emotional or psychologically, but psychological. But God is able. He loves us. He knows us by name. He says, I am the Lord, your healer. He wants to invade your heart and your life and also invade your need with his presence. And in his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence is everything that you and I seek and desire and want and need. So today, many of you are watching, and I know you have needs too. You have things that you're asking God for right now. You may feel very alone, but you're not. Today, we're praying together with you. You know, your need doesn't have to be mentioned on this program for God to meet it. He's listening. He hears you. We link our hearts and our words and our minds with you today. And that is biblical. God is present. Gordon? Well, we do have some Facebook prayer requests that we are going to mention. This is Josh. He writes in, my friend Chris was in a bad car accident and it doesn't look good. Please pray for a miracle. And let's just encourage you with the mm -hmm. story you just saw. It's never too yeah. big for God. Lewis says, I have stage four cancer. I need a full body healing. I know God can do a miracle. And then Tanya writes in, please pray for my nephew, Christian. He's struggling with depression and PTSD after losing three friends to suicide. He's also struggling with God and with his faith. And let's just lift these two to the Lord and realize nothing is too hard for him. Nothing. We don't have to argue with him. We don't have to cajole him. We don't have to beg and plead. He wants to be God. He wants to be our savior. He wants to be our healer. He wants to be our all in all. Let's go to him now. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you right now. And we pray specifically for th these prayer requests for Chris, who's been in this car wreck. Lord God, do a miracle. Stretch forth your hand to re-knit his body. We just come against any internal bleeding now in Jesus' name. Uh, and just ask for a complete and total restoration. And then for Lewis with his cancer, Lord, you're, you're above any cancer. We just ask now that those cancer cells stop reproducing in the name of Jesus. And that healthy cells would move in and take over and reproduce normally as you intended. 
And now for this young man who's, who's having PTSD, who's lost three friends to suicide. Lord, you know him by name. You count every hair on his head. And I just ask that you would show up in power to let him know that you are the God of all comfort. Comfort him now in his grief. Give him hope. Give him a future. Show him the destiny that you have prepared for him. And now for all who are watching, we just declare over them that you forgive all our disease, all our iniquity. You heal all our diseases. You are the God who renews our strength. Mm -hmm. And we receive it now. And we bless you for what you have done, what you're about to do, and who you are. For you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's someone with sharp pain in your right shoulder. It's related to a pinched nerve in your neck. Uh, spine area. God's healing that. He's reducing the pressure on that nerve. He's just setting you completely free from that. You're starting to feel all those tense muscles just relax into that shoulder, all the way up that nerve. All the damage is being repaired right now in Jesus' name. What you couldn't do before, move that arm around and realize you've been set free from it. It's healed now in Jesus' name. Terry? And as Gordon was praying, I, the scripture just came to me. There's somebody who is, you're, you've had trouble with mobility and with walking. And it's the scripture that says, you shall rise up on wings like eagles. You'll walk and not be weary. You'll run and not faint. Just st step up right now. Stand up, stretch, and just begin to move in ways you've not been able to move before. God is healing you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for everything you do, who you are. And we receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen. If you've been touched by God, share your good report. Let us know what God has done for you. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. Uh, numbers on the screen. Do it now. Well, coming up, a drunk driver struggles with what he's done. To take responsibility for the death of two 20-year-old girls who had their whole life ahead of them, I didn't want to be responsible for it. I didn't know what life from that moment forward would ever offer me ever again. His amazing story of redemption and forgiveness right after this. Well, what started out as an innocent night out with friends ended with Eric Smallridge facing 20 years in prison after he killed two young women while driving drunk. Eric thought his life was over, but he was given a second chance in an unlikely place. May 10th of 2002, it was a Friday afternoon. I had spent all day with my friends. We came to this bar, one beer had led to another, and next thing you know, the lights in the bar were coming on and it was two o'clock in the morning. I just kind of figured that I would be okay. Went right out to the truck and jumped in. As we went into this curve, the Camaro on my right, it all of a sudden starts to merge into my lane. So I just instinctively jerked the wheel. I never even saw the car that had pulled into the inside lane. When I came to, in the midst of all the airbag smoke and the radiator hissing. Glass was everywhere. An officer comes over and he was like, what happened, what happened? He asked me, have, had I been drinking? I told him I had. And at that point, the lights are coming on and I'm seeing this car and I'm seeing people frantically working around the car. And I see them actually bring white sheets out. And I'm thinking to myself, what's really going on here? And they said, you don't want to be responsible for this. And I said, responsible for what? And that's when he looked at me and he said, there's two girls that are dead in that car over there. To take responsibility for the death of two 20-year-old girls who had their whole life ahead of them, I didn't want to be responsible for it. I didn't know what life from that moment forward would ever offer me ever again. I was a 24-year-old kid facing a minimum of 20 years, and I was scared. They said, 
you can't look at the families. You know, I said, well, I need to say sorry to them. And they said, you can't say you're sorry. And I said, what do you mean they lost their kids? They lost their daughters. And they said, well, listen, if you want 20 years in prison, then you go out there and you tell them you're sorry. And just go out there and sit at the table and pay attention to the papers on the table or the judge. That's what I did. Here I was in a very dark world and my mom drops the Bible off and I'm thinking to myself, it's probably too late for me. And that's when another inmate comes over and he starts talking to me. He said, do you believe in, in God? And I said, well, you know, I believe in God, but I don't really think he wants to have a relationship with me right now. And he said, well, that's where you're wrong. We started reading the word a little bit and that's when I came across Genesis 50, 20. They intended to harm you, but God intended it for good for what is being accomplished, the saving of many lives. When I first read that scripture, it gave me a lot of hope. The chaplain came by, we went down to a holding cell, and I gave my life to Christ. On October 3rd, I was brought back to court for sentencing. Hearing each person come up and talk and address the judge and me, it was heart-wrenching. And then Renee, Megan's mom had the ability to look over to me and say, I forgive you. Here was this mother who lost her daughter looking at the guy who took that from her and saying that I forgive you. I was so young in Christ at that point that there was still some doubt. Are you sure, God, that you can still accept me? Are you sure that I can be forgiven. And then she spoke it. I just, I fell apart. I'm really sorry to the families for what I've done. I've caused so much pain and there's nothing I can do. I've asked God to help me. And he has, but that's not going to bring me to Lisa back. I wish I could. I would give my life. I would honestly give my life. I wrote him letters, and I made a phone call to Megan's grandmother, and she told me that Renee was there. I knew in my heart that it was my fault. I needed her to hear me say that. And so I told her, I said, Renee, I just want you to know that I take full responsibility for what I did that night. It was what she needed to hear. In August of 2006, we come into this courtroom. It was a very brief hearing. It was called a beggar's motion. No law is discussed. You simply beg for mercy. These families had come to a motion on my behalf. You would expect my family to do that, but then the families, Megan and Lisa's parents and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, it was like, holy cow, they're supporting that. Even if the judge says no, the blessing's already been given. And the judge came back. He said, on recess, I read something, and it was in Micah 6.8. Oh man, what does the Lord require of thee? But to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. He said, I have never in my life seen anything like this. Mr. Smallridge, these families have come here to try to give you a second chance at life. So I'm gonna run these sentences concurrent. Megan and Lisa, if I could say one thing to them, it would be that they were God's angels being used for a purpose, that their lives are just as magnificent now as they were then, that they are still affecting people's everyday life. Without receiving forgiveness, you can't move forward. There is no hope. If we don't forgive self or receive forgiveness from the things we've done in our past, we have to still accept it from Christ and to know that as long as we turn away from those actions. And as long as we walk the walk that is approved in God's eyes, that we are truly forgiven. What an amazing story, an amazing story of forgiveness, redemption, 
the power of the gospel, uh, the ability to have not just mercy, but actual reconciliation, uh, to say, we receive you. Yes, you, you killed our daughters, but we receive you, and we don't want you now to be in prison for 22 years. How do you get to that point? And how do you get to the point of forgiveness where you really do let it go and you really do want the best for the other person? Jesus taught about it. He taught a great deal. And one of the things he taught about was someone who went to a king, he had a huge debt, could never repay it. The king was saying, well, let's throw you into debtor's prison. Let's sell your family. And that's what would happen in those days if you couldn't repay your debts. And the man fell on his knees. He begged for forgiveness. And the king said, okay, I forgive the debt. I set you free. You owe me nothing. Uh, go your way. And then that same man who had been forgiven for so much when he found that he was owed a very small amount by someone else, he demanded payment, demanded immediate payment. And then when he couldn't get that, he did the same thing he asked for mercy for. He, he threw the man into prison. Well, the parable goes on to say, well, when the ruler found out about it, he revoked his forgiveness. The man ended up in jail and he was it's an unusual verse. He was delivered to the torturers. And that's what happens to you and I when we hold on to unforgiveness. That bitterness becomes part of our innermost being. It poisons us. And we start to look at the world with eyes of bitterness, eyes of anger, eyes of revenge, instead of the eyes of love that God wants us to have. You have to be set free from it. You literally need a miracle to happen for you to have the forgiveness that Jesus gave from the cross where he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And when you have that forgiveness, then you truly become like him and you truly are set free. If there are things in your heart that this brief talk has sort of triggered in you, that you're holding things. It could have been for decades. It could have been something that happened in your childhood. Let it go today. And if you need help with that, if you need someone to say, uh, how do you get to that? All you have to do is call us. Number's on the screen, 1-800-700-7000. Realize you can walk free of it. It doesn't have to torture you anymore. You can be free from it and free indeed. We also have a free booklet for you on forgiveness, keys to powerful living. It's all free. All you have to do is make a free phone call, ask for it. We can send it out to you right away. Uh, do it now. Be free from all of the things that are holding you back from fullness with him. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still to come, a young girl born with two club feet. I feel pain because she is my child. I can't look at her without crying, but I can't do anything for her. I can't pay for the surgery. See how viewers like you help this girl and her family when we come back. Today, Samira is always on her feet, dancing for joy. But when we first met her, she could barely walk and her condition broke her mom's heart. Samira's eyes sparkle when she smiles. The spirited seven-year-old from Western Ukraine seems to have no cares in the world. The truth is, Samira was born with two club feet, a serious disability that causes severe pain and limits her movement. Her mother, Nora, suffers too. I feel pain because she's my child. I can't look at her without crying but I can't do anything for her. I can't pay for the surgery that would allow her to walk and run and play like other children. Samira rarely cries, but this day her tears fall when she sees her mother crying. I have one dream, 
for Samira to be healthy and walk normally. Yet Nora knows her dream is unlikely to come true. This poor family can barely afford food. And like most people in this village, Nora and her husband are uneducated and their job opportunities are limited. My husband is hired by people to do jobs like cutting grass or digging graves and is only paid two to four dollars a day. That's why Nora was overjoyed when CBN's Orphan's Promise opened a school nearby. She enrolled Samira right away. But we knew that Samira needed much more than reading and writing skills. She needed surgery that her parents could never afford. So it wasn't long before we located a skilled surgeon and paid the full cost of Samira's surgery and post-operative care. Eleven months later, when Samira's cast was removed, her legs and feet were normal. My child can do everything. What else could I ever want? Thank you, because it all is because of you. I can walk and run. I can play with other children. I even take dancing lessons at my school. Thank you for giving me straight legs. Thank you for caring about children that you will never meet in this world, but whose lives are forever changed by your kindness and generosity. Join with us. Join the 700 Club, 65 cents a day, $20 a month. Just call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a scripture for you. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. God bless you. We'll see you again.